One of the biggest risks facing this country is electricity supply. For the 2022 financial year, we've been warned to expect at least 100 days of load shedding. It's going to get worse over winter months before it gets better. Why is the situation at ESCOM not turning around? Well, that's one of the questions we're hoping will be answered, at least by the end of this interview. Joining me in conversation today, Professor Malakhapuru Mahoba, who is the ESCOM board chair. Prof Mahoba, thank you so much for making time to speak to us today. Uh, thank you, Kathy, and your colleagues for giving me the opportunity, I think, to state the case for ESCOM over this very difficult period that we're going through in terms of load shedding and, and other issues. The responsibility of supplying electricity to the nation rests with ESCOM because regardless of efforts to bring in alternative energy supply sources on board, ESCOM is still the monopoly. You must have people that meet you in the street and ask, Prof Mahoba, when are we going to have stable electricity supply? That is true. I think uh, the question is even much more than that, that when there is load shedding, I get a lot of SMSs and a lot of calls and people swear at me. And as you know, in baby culture, when you, your ears start to itch, it means people are gossiping around you. I've never had my ears itch so much since I became the chairperson of the board of ESCOM. So I presume that it tells you how intimately linked ESCOM is to the lives of South Africans. It is not simply about the economy, it is about the well-being of people. And that's really something that we often forget. We think about the economy first, but uh, we should not forget that the well-being of the ordinary people of South Africa suffers when we have load shedding or when we don't have a consistent, a reliable electricity supply. That for me is the thing that uh, worries me, it concerns me, it occupies my mind, and sometimes it gives me lots of sleepless nights. Of course, while it worries and it concerns many South Africans, we're not all the ESCOM board chair. You are in a position where you're expected to do something yes. about it. That is, that is absolutely correct. And uh, maybe I should just state it up front. Uh, my role and my role and the role of the board is not to complain, is not to look backwards, is to find solutions for my fellow countrymen, myself included. So my role is to look for solutions within ESCOM that can provide, I think, uh, happiness and bring good well-being to South Africans as a whole. That's what occupies my mind. I'm not, I'm not given in the, in the aspect of blaming the past or blaming so and so. I've been appointed to find a solution and that's what I'm looking for together with my colleagues in the board. So when we were brought as board, we were given almost clear mandate there was corruption at ESCOM. There was poor governance at ESCOM. There was poor performance at ESCOM. There was load shedding at ESCOM. There were poor ethics at ESCOM. And our role was to try and address this as part of a package uh, in order to bring ESCOM back to be the company better than what it used to be in the supply of electricity uh, to the country and to support the economy of the country. Of course, in order to do that, I think you had to go back to basics as to, to what had led to where we are, but that's not what I want to dwell into because we know what had happened. I think it's, it's common cause to everybody what had happened in the past 15 to 20 years at ESCOM. But the question is not that which has happened, is what are we planning to do in order to solve the, the situation? Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to concern myself, I think, in this interview. I, I know you don't want to get drawn too much into the past, but it will be important to get your reflections as the board chair yeah. about what you believe led to the crumbling of ESCOM that you then were brought in to try and help revive. 
reshape? Well, uh, as I say, I think it's common cause for all South Africans that there was corruption, endemic corruption, and that has been demonstrated uh, by the latest report of the, of the Zondo Commission that there was massive endemic uh, corruption at ESCOM that looted the company. And as a consequence of that, certain things did not take place at ESCOM. Uh, the production of electricity is a simple mechanical issue of having mechanical instruments that produce that electricity. And like any mechanical uh, sort of instrument, you have to take care of it. If you have a car, you have to service it. When you don't service your car, it has breakdowns. And the longer you don't service it, the more breakdowns you're going to get when it reaches the end of its lifetime. So we know that I think for the better part of between 15 and 20 years, I think the servicing of the 85 units that we have to produce electricity in the country were not properly serviced. And then when we lately built new uh, electricity supply units, uh, such as Midupi and Kusili, they were littered with mechanical defects that we had to repair in order to get them to stream and be commercialized and be able to join the grid. So there has been this an element, a mixture of not servicing, a mixture of delaying bringing more energy or electricity into the grid. And, uh, and as I say, the looting that was taking place at ESCOM. This is a mixture of things. But really, as I keep on emphasizing, uh, the role of the board at this juncture, as somebody put it, is to account and to find solutions. Because otherwise, there's no other role that we can play as a board. When we look at some of the reports that have been put together by ESCOM itself, this endemic corruption that you speak about is still very much with the organization that you haven't been able to root out those who are looting the coffers of ESCOM. Well, uh, thank you for, for bringing this question. Actually, uh, the endemic corruption that we found when we took over as a board is being addressed very, very seriously. As you know, the fourth report of the Zondo Commission has come out. The basis for the evidence that went to, to the Zondo Commission was laid down by this board that I chair currently. So we provided the evidence for that. Uh, before the report came out, uh, the Minister of Public Enterprises, I think, uh, assembled all the SOE and warn them that the reports of the Zondo commissions are going to be coming out and we should all prepare ourselves as to how we're going to respond because the president at some point or another is gonna have to speak to parliament to find solution and address some of the recommendations. As ESCOM, we had, have made a thorough preparation for that. We have set up a, a project team uh, that consists of an internal group of people and an external law firm to advise us as to how to tackle the issues that are raised as recommendations and findings of the Zondo Commission. In addition to that, we have taken the opportunity, I think, to engage the law enforcement uh, uh, sort of structures, such as the special investigation units. We have been working with them with some of the findings that we have made ourselves and we are collaborating very closely with the NPA in order to tackle some of these issues, particularly the syndicates that are dealing with the, uh, you know, um, copper thefts and so forth. So there is a project within ESCOM to address the looting that used to take place. But just to bring it really into, into context, when we first started, there were people in the higher echelons of ESCOM that were involved in the lootings. And obviously those are, have found themselves in through the reports of the, there was the board that preceded us that has been obviously named or identified within the, the, Zondo, the Zondo Commission uh, reports. At the moment when you come here to ESCOM, 
the level at which this looting is taking place is no longer at the executive or the management. It has gone down into the power station. And that's where we are focusing our attention in order to address that level of corruption. I agree with you, it is not completely gone, but it has changed the levels where it is taking place. And that tells you that there is an, there is an impact of what the board has been doing in the sense that I think conflicts of interest are recorded at every meet meeting and they are taken very seriously and people are, are warned when they do have those kinds of things like that. So there is a whole range of things. We have reported people to the SAPS, several cases, and it is the duty of the SAPS to do that. As I say, we are collaborating with the NPA, uh, the, the National Pro Prosecuting Authority, and they are giving us support. And obviously now that the report is out, we will be able to address some of the corruption that has been endemic at ESCOM. But if I have to give a snapshot, the level of corruption at ESCOM has reduced significantly. It has changed from being at the senior level to the lower levels of the organization. It is more rampant in certain of our power stations and we are beginning to address that. Of course, South Africans would want to know that you as a board are not only tackling it, but you know, when we talk about this corruption at power stations, how much money is actually involved here? Because at ESCOM, you talk about 1 billion rand, 50 billion rand, that's nothing in the context of the broader financial position of the institution. But this is an institution whose financial sustainability and viability is facing serious risk. Yeah, well, that's absolutely correct. I mean, one of the biggest uh, uh, issues that we want to address, obviously, is the massive debts that uh, we have found in ESCOM. And we are working together with the, with the the Department of Public Enterprises, National Treasury, and uh, Minerals and Energy to try and address th this issue, this issue of debt. But a lot of that can also be accounted in terms of billions from the looting that has taken place. And uh, as I say, at the moment, uh, I know like every South African, I want to see people in orange overalls. I've yet to see one, mm -hmm. but you know, that is not what ESCOM can do. Uh, I can provide evidence to the NPA, I can provide evidence to the S SAPS, but I'm not in the legal system to be able to arrest people. So all that ESCOM can do, it's limited to a certain point. We can provide the findings, the investigations that we have done, and if we think they merit to go into the law enforcement the agencies, they do go there. So the question that people have to ask is not to ask ESCOM what they've done because it is common cause or public knowledge the number of cases that we've taken to the SAPS, to the NPA, and obviously, like everybody else, we're waiting for the NB NPA to prosecute in the manner that they deem fit within the legal system of the country. that that hampers um, the ability of the board to change the culture of, of corruption and to end corruption if there is this perceived lax approach, lack of, I lack of action or at least uh, quick enough action from the prosecuting agencies? I think it doesn't hamper the board. It hampers every South African. I mean, if you ask every South African what do they want to see out of the Zondo Commission report, is to see a few guys or girls being arrested and serving in prison. But we are not seeing that. And of course, we have to respect, I think, the mandate of the NPA is that they will prosecute within the law and, then wha and when there is sufficient evidence that they think the cases are winnable, and we must give them that space. But nevertheless, it doesn't stop the impatience mm -hmm. of all of us in South Africa to say, 
there has been so much looting and there is so much evidence, but there is little to show for it in terms of the culprits that have been involved in the looting of our country. Let's talk about where we are now from yeah. a generation capacity point of view. When we look at the energy availability factor for ESCOM, yeah. it's not looking good. It has been declining. Um, at, at the time that the board took over, it could well have been sitting in the upper 60s. We're now sitting at the lower 60s. Some experts are predicting it's going to be in the upper 50s for the first quarter of this year. Um, that's, that's not good at all. A and that's something that this board can account for. Yeah, I, uh, I take responsibility for that and accountability for that. I agree that the energy availability factor has been declining, but as, a, as an electricity supply uh, company, I think we are doing, we're putting every effort to try and, and rectify the energy availability factor. Let me give maybe a few examples. What we're trying to do is to enter into something that is called reliability uh, maintenance, which means we are trying to really do the work that uh, ought to have been done 20 years ago to repair, to take out units, go and repair them and br bring them back into the, into, the, into the system or into the grid. That we have just started maybe about I would say at maximum 18 months ago, uh, we are doing 12 percent of the, u the the units that we have at the moment, and we believe that by doing that, it will buy us time, but it will also give us more, I think, uh, available energy into the grid that will provide us e with enough electricity. The second area that we are tackling is the one of corruption and theft that is taking place. Uh, contributing, I think, to the load shedding that we're seeing at s some of the power station. And uh, cases are being reported to the SAPS. Some are undergoing disciplinary action within, within the organization in order to root out, I think, this uh, so-called human error that comes into the, into the places. The third area that we are correcting is the defects of the new power stations. I mean, Midupi and Kusile have not delivered what they were supposed to deliver in over a period of 14 years because of these defects that were part of the design of the system and the delay in which it has occurred mm -hmm. and the escalating, escalating cost. Now, as of the latest, Midupi has six units to supply electricity into the grid. As is common cause, one of those units exploded, called Unit 4. It is now uh, going to undergo repair, and that repair will be done through an insurance company, so it will not cost us, uh, as the fiscals, anything because it was insured. The five units that are at Midupi are all repaired now in terms of their defects, they are all functioning well and delivering energy into the grid. So the work of Midupi has been complete in terms of repair and in terms of commercialization. I think we are just adding, you know, dotting the T's and I's, but that project that we were supposed to do as a board has been done. The, the situation is different at Kosile. Because what we, the approach we took was that let's start with one power station, make lessons from there, and then transfer those lessons into the next power station. So we did Midubi first, it's now complete. We have now moved into Kusile towards the end of last year, around October. And what we did was to take the manager, the project manager at Midupi, to bring her into Kusile so that the lessons that have been learned at uh, Midupi are translated very quickly into, into Kusile. And we have started on Kusile, and we have set a target date when we would be finished. At the moment, 
three of the of the five or six units at Kusile are in commercial operation. operation. The only other snack at Kusile is that we have introduced a new technology that is environmentally clean or friendly uh, because we're all moving into the green energy to remove the emissions that are coming out there. It's called FGD, which is flu gas desulfurization uh, uh, technology in order to remove the emissions that come out of Kusile. So that has tended to delay, I think, the process of the repairs of the design defects, but uh, we have set up mm. a target date when that will be finished. Why could the processes of correcting these power stations not be done simultaneously? So I it's good to want to take lessons from one to the other, but that's the kind of time that South Africans don't have. It's the kind of patience because all it's saying is that you know we we extended load shedding even more while we were busy with this one here before we could go to to the other and uh, you know uh, uh, kathy and uh, fellow south africans if i may use that expression uh, escom it's a complex science and technology program so in, in any scientific project, you have to have a pilot study. You have to have a proof of principle. When you inherit something that has got multiple defects that have been there as part of the design, you have to ask yourself when you are going to re repair it, how do you start in order to learn some lessons? It is, uh, it's better to focus take good lessons from a pilot project than to diffuse yourself and be mistaken in every project. Then you waste more time and you haven't bought any time for anybody and you will solve no problem. So a scientific project such as ESCOM requires that you set up yourself a project pilot uh, uh, to do and you learn the lessons from there, then you are able to rapidly translate it into the next phase and you save time, you save costs, and you save actually the lessons that you learn better by having that. Because I think if you spread yourself everywhere, you learn nothing and get more confused and you waste more time. The broader picture that still emerges, at least this is one that many South Africans will be concerned with, is that ultimately we came into this financial year in a, in a deficit. We're never going to be able to provide enough energy to meet our demand. That situation has worsened due to some of the unexpected, unforeseen um, challenges that ESCOM is, is facing. And when we do the calculations, um, at least as of April, the warning was that we must expect at least about three months of, of load shedding if we were to compound it. Now that's a grim picture. It is a, a grim picture, but it is not a picture that should make all of us lose hope. Let me bring it back maybe to a field I know a little bit better. When we were dealing with the pandemic, we always had been given modeling, predictions, and those pictures the predictions of those models were never good. But all the time when the modeling and the predictions came, we were often given a hope as to what, a hope and a challenge as to what we can do to get better. You know, get vaccination and uh, uh, put masks, don't be overcrowded, wash your hands and so forth. So these predictions are useful to remind all of us what we need to do in terms of electricity. And I want to say this, I think all of us want to get rid of load shedding. We want to end load shedding. And we will end load shedding. It is not going to be there forever. Uh, I think we're putting all our, our best brains to try and find a solution to the end of load shedding. Uh, I think we do have some ideas. We will put those together and mark my ways, two to three years from now, we will not have load shedding. When are we going to be able to 
very specifically have the kind of generation capacity that that will end load shedding and i'm not talking speculatively here yeah, yeah. i mean definitively yeah. um because you tell south africans not to lose hope yeah. but at this point we don't have reason to hope well let's let's put it this way i've just told you that uh, midupi is functioning well it's been repaired kusile will be repaired over the next 18 months or so it will be repaired Quebec at the moment, as you know, I think uh, uh, one of the units at, at Quebec is undergoing uh, major repair and maintenance. And that obviously has also taken away, I think, from what is available uh, in terms of electricity as the most reliable uh, you know, uh, unit that produces electricity. In fact, if only we had Quebec as part of our electricity supply, the EAF would be about 90% in the country. That's how well it is functioning. But as I say, as you know, it has got two units, and one of those units at the moment is under repair, and it has taken a lot of what is available in terms of our electricity supply. So I think once Quebec is back on stream, both Kusile and Midupi are back on stream, and a few of these other uh, power stations that we are hoping to focus on. Uh, we are hoping to focus on three power stations that really take away or lower the EAF in the country. And we have a, a project that is coming in in which we are going to uh, provide skills and we are going to provide a different type of maintenance that is outsourced and by bringing outsiders into the system, we hope that it will also disrupt the culture, the internal culture of corruption that is in those, in those uh, units. So all in all, I think we are trying to find solutions, I think, to end load shedding. Finally, I just, I just want to say this again, that one of the things that we are going to do, or what I plan to do, is South Africa is full of very clever engineers. And something like this, I think, should not be something we lose hope upon if we bring all the brains together, the brain trust of South Africa together, and say, this is a national priority, a national project. Let's find solutions. Not, let's find who we can blame. I don't want to do that. talk about the the reliability maintenance recovery program it's one of those that you have mentioned saying yeah. that the board is um, giving a lot of attention to yeah. its maintenance work yeah you've also been falling behind in that maintenance schedule what is leading to those delays? okay let's let's put it this way I think as I indicated maintenance was neglected I think that is also uh, public knowledge that maintenance was neglected so when you enter into reliability maintenance, you need to have a budget. You need to plan two years in advance for the project itself. And as I've said, we have about 85 units that may need some form of repairs or, n or not, uh, excluding maybe the, the new power stations that we are already repairing, and we have repaired one of them. So, so Basically, it is the planning, it is the budget, and it is also finding the proper contractors that needs to do those maintenance, uh, repair maintenance. So at the moment, I think, uh, as they say in Zulu, Hambaganyani, we started on slowly because of the budget constraint, because of the short time of planning, but we are now getting into the stream of doing that, and I think we're doing it a little bit better. So I am not too concerned. As I say, we've only started less than 18 months ago to do this 
reliability maintenance thing. And, and obviously, we will begin to measure it. I think uh, I'm not even sure how many units we've done, maybe not more than 10 that we've done out of 85. Mm -hmm. So we're still very far to be able to measure the impact of what it can do. So, so I think these are the things that I think as a scientist you do. You know, you can't sort of like uh, go off on a rampage, mm -hmm. uh, waste money, waste time, and y you don't have the proper contractors that are supposed to repair these units, and you end up with eggs on your face rather than uh, uh, something else a bit different, like a better makeup or something like that. You're talking about the, the, the financial constraints, and one of the things that ESCOM has been putting, at least in the public space, is its customers. The yeah. fact that you have this very high um, debt that is owed to ESCOM by its customers. But a lot, of, a lot of it is coming out of municipalities. It's a political hot potato. But at the end of the day, you as a board still have to ensure that this company is financially viable. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, it, it's, it's interesting you put it as a, it's more than a political hot potato. It, it is, a, I don't know how to describe it in English, but uh, it, is a, it is a major problem. And uh, to be frank, I think from the president of the country to the ministers that are involved in, uh, in relation to the governance of ESCOM, they have all been supportive. I mean, National Treasury, the DPE, and so forth. I'm not saying that they are not uh, having their own difficulties. As you know, polit politics at its best is never easy. It's a messy business and it has got its own alliances that one day fall and uh, they form and fall. So I think we are operating in that political quagmire. But as ESCOM, we do receive the support, we do receive the promises, and we do receive the encouragement. And, you know, all we can do is to take the best that is available and hope for the best. Uh, it doesn't substitute that we as a board and, and the executive, we must do the best that we can do because we, we are just uh, one part of a bigger picture. And I think as an element of the bigger picture, we must play our role as best as you can. And I think the board does that and the executive is doing that. 40.9 billion rand, that's how much ESCOM is owed in terms of municipal areas. Uh, it's a lot of money. Yeah. And you've undertaken various measures to try and recoup those monies. In some instances, we've seen you attach some of the assets and, and properties of municipalities. Explain to us how this conversation takes place with all of these different stakeholders that you've mentioned now. You've talked about the president, you've talked about ministers, um, because that is clearly a factor um, b one gets the frustration, at least from CEO Andre Dureta, yeah. that there's only so much ESCOM can do well, in trying to recoup those monies. Well, that is true. I mean, I've said that even about the, the cases that we lay at the SAPS. There is just so much we can do. But, uh, you know, the, the point about, uh, about what the board and the ESCO can do is to be persistent in what we do. Because as you have indicated clearly, it is a political issue. And, and that issue is going to be solved when I think the politics of our country get better than they are at the moment, and the alliances are better. And maybe the municipalities are better resourced or uh, there is less corruption in the municipality uh, than it is at the moment. Remember that I think if you were to look at the uh, the corruption that is so endemic in our country, it uh, filters down even to the mi municipalities. I mean, lots of people complain about poor services because of corruption in municipalities. So it is not a simple issue to solve, and there's no silver bullet, but it's going to require the collective uh, will of the municipality, of the provinces, of the national government, 
and of ESCOM and the various other stakeholders to come together to solve a national problem. So it is not an ESCOM thing. But what ESCOM board and the executive can do is not to keep quiet and just give up and say, well, it's not our problem because we have to supply the electricity. So what's your approach to it now? Uh, our approach is we are in serious conversations with National Treasury, with DPE, with the minerals and uh, resources, with the uh, Barbara Crisis Department, with the various task team that this, the president has set up, the Minister of uh, Public Enterprise has set up, in order to try and resolve this huge debt of ESCOM. That is a process that is taking place. I think from ESCOM's point of view, it's led by the CFO, Mr. Khalid Kasim and, uh, uh, and Mr. Andre Dereta on behalf of the board. But that's what we are trying to do. We just keep on pushing so that we can get to convince them or for them to come together and realize that the problem of ESCOM, which is interlinked with the life and the livelihoods of South Africans, is really something that requires a national collective effort to solve it. Is it going to end up in some form of bailout, payout of that debt directly to ESCOM by National Treasury? Is, is the idea of, of that debt being cancelled, at least on ESCOM's part, part of those conversations? Of course, somebody will have to foot the bill. Yeah. Uh, but the question is, who is going to foot that bill? Well, I think uh, there are various models that are being followed up by National Treasury and DPE and Minerals and Aid to solve the debt problem of ESCOM. Uh, I'm not at this juncture able to say, but they are looking at various options to try and resolve the debt. Uh, I agree with you, at the end of the day, somebody's gonna have to pay and, uh, and, and, and ESCOM has to recoup the money somewhere and, and use it. But you know, I'm very optimistic that that will happen. Uh, I can't say how long it will take. How long is it going to take for us to bring on additional capacity to the grid to be able to lessen the load shedding that we're facing? You know, this is a, this is a very familiar question in South Africa. And I say it's familiar because about four years ago, four years ago, we said we required between 4,000 and 6,000 megawatts of electricity into the grid. That is what ESCOM calculated. Just like we are now saying it will take us about 100 days mm -hmm. uh, of load shedding. So we provide this kind of things as the source of energy or source of electricity. That was said to government because uh, only government can do that kind of project. And uh, there are conversations that are going up. The president stood up and said, uh, you know, we can have 100 uh, megawatts without uh, too much fuss in terms of the bureaucracy. These are things that we're able to have ideas, but we are hopeless at implementing and recognizing the agency and the priority of those ideas. And I can say this to you, I was in the National Planning Commission for 10 years. A beautiful document, well written, well researched, with clear recommendations, and we still suffer from lack of implementation of that. So as a country, we are shy of implementation. We are good at debates, we are good at the speculation, and spending time talking ad nauseum on issues of importance. But when we say, let's now do it and act, people disappear. So part of the problem is us as South African. The correlation between ideas and implementation is absolutely horrible. And we have to learn that throughout society that ideas don't implement themselves. And ideas require speed, require decisiveness, require the ethics of implementing those ideas. We don't seem to learn from those. We seem to latch from one failure to the other. 
in terms of beautiful documents that we have written, beautiful ideas that we have debated and written. But where are they? They are all hanging around in wardrobes and in libraries. And maybe we don't need to, to, to debate issues. We just need to go to the libraries and pick up all the things that we have discussed and start implementing. What you're saying about ESCOM being the one that can talk about this is the amount of generating capacity that we need and it then rests with the Minister of Energy to go ahead and, and help to um, resource and capacitate that. That, that makes the Minister a, a central and a key player in this conversation. Is ESCOM having conversations with the Energy Department and if so, what is the nature of those conversations? Are you putting them under pressure to find out when exactly you're going to, you're going to be able to get this additional capacity? Well, let's, let's put it this way. Uh, you know, uh, the minister is a South African. He experiences load shedding. And uh, I think, or I believe, he should be conversant with what is on the ground about this whole issue of uh, the constrained energy supply in the country. And as I say, as uh, I've said, long before this uh, load shedding, we had requested additional electricity supply to the system of, of between four and 5,000. Now, let's also understand where ESCOM is located at this. ESCOM, it's a doer. It's not a policy maker in the country. And th the policies of the country rest within the Minister of Minerals and Energy. And, and ESCOM does what the, poli the policy framework requests it to do. But because it operates at the level of expert professional sort of uh, uh, contribution, it is able to make predictions and to model this, the needed energy supply of the country into the future, just like it is able to model how many days you may have to undergo in terms of load shedding, because it is run by experts who have got the professionalism to do that. But that that is how societies operate. You have a panel or a group of experts that run one thing, and then you've got the policy makers that run the other element. It is when those two combine effectively and efficiently that you then get the system, I think, to hum like a good car engine. I think at the moment we are having uh, what I would call glitches uh, that you know, uh, as I s I've indicated somewhere else, we don't seem to understand the issue of priority and agency. <laughs> but we can talk about what we need without actually saying, hey, this needs to be done in three months. Mm. I mean, it must be said that something can be said so long time ago and very little has been done within this period when now we're facing a cr crisis mm. And, and of course, when the crisis comes, everybody goes to the supplier, which is ESCOM. But as, I, as I've said to you, the, the idea of my being in the board is not to blame, is to encourage everybody to realize there are priorities, there are time frames, and the well-being of people is suffering, and let's, let's sort this out. Uh, so, so if I'm to read between the lines, Professor Makoba, you're saying that it hasn't been t dealt with with the requisite urgency, at least on the part of, of, of the, the, the policy um, representative. Well, that's quite correct. 
I mean, and, and I say it is not the only one. It's not the only thing. I gave you an example of the NPC mm. and its recommendations. We don't seem to be able to be decisive. I want to unpack the parables a little bit, go to what your one of your board members, Busi Mavuso, said yeah. uh, before the Standing Committee on Public Accounts recently. Yeah. She said that ESCOM would not be the fall guy for the some of the current problems that it finds itself in and that in fact the ANC was responsible for this mess. Listening to you speak, you've spoken about the limitations to the work that ESCOM itself can do yeah. and how reliant you are yeah. on the ministers, some dependent, ministers. Dependent, we're, de we're dependent, not yeah, and yes. reliant, yeah. Yes, how dependent you are. Yeah. So I I in that sense then, is what she said, is that the view generally of the ESCOM board, that there are things in this current moment that you are unable to get done because you don't have that commitment politically, despite what is on paper, to, to see through what, what has been promised? No, I think I wouldn't put it there. I think the way that we don't have commitment, it's a... It's a. It's very harsh. I think we do have commitment. We do have support. But as I've indicated, I think, as they say, the long arm of the law is too long. I think the long arm of politics in South Africa is still too long. We we know what our priorities are. You know, we know we have poverty, inequality, unemployment. What have we done about those? We've spoken about them ad nauseum. Have we done anything? But people are trying in different ways. So th there is this disjuncture between what we want to achieve. We want to go to heaven, but we don't want to die. That's what, ha that's what South Africans are. They all want to be in heaven. Nobody wants to be in hell, but they don't want to die. And that culture permeates society in many aspects. So uh, what Busi said, uh, that we don't want to be the full guy, was correct. But remember that she was being asked about count accountability, and she wasn't afraid to account. Of course, she was never given the opportunity to account. She was being asked about accountability. And she said that we, we are accountable, and I think we must be very clear about that. But she was never given that opportunity to demonstrate how accountable we are. And that's part of the reason why I'm, con I'm doing this, mm -hmm. is to show that as a board, we are accountable. There are things that we are doing or that we have done that I think uh, the country should know. Uh, you know, we have, uh, we have been able, as I said, to lay the basis for what is being found in the Zondo Commission. We have been able to deal ruthlessly with the rampant corruption that, was, that has been taking place at ESCOM. We are obviously clear that those people that have been identified uh, in the Zondo Commission will face what is necessary for them to be faced in order to account for what they did there. And we are doing everything in terms of cost cutting, uh, in terms of uh, uh, trying to deal with the clean energy or the so-called uh, just transition. All of these things are what the board is doing, uh, and, and saving money, cost cutting, and trying to find different models of dealing with the debts at, at ESCOM. So all of this is what we have been asked to do, and we're doing them as best as we can within the framework and within the political uh, context in which we live. We, we can't operate any other way because of the way the legal structure and framework of ESCOM is. We are the doer, there are policy makers, and we have to work together, and that's what we try to do. What did you make of how she was treated? Um, I was, I was, uh, I was upset. Uh, I was this, I, I felt, I felt very uncomfortable because, you know, I've worked with Busi. She's a frank and honest person. She never, she talks straight. 
And what she talks about, I think she has thought about a little bit, and uh, she's often very honest. So yeah, uh, but uh, but I think to cut the long story short, I think the people who treated it that way have apologized, and I think I accept that apology. Uh, as it as it happens, you know, uh, I have it. A very good relationship with uh, uh, Honorable Sengwe. Uh, he was a student of the, the SRC when I was Vice Chancellor at the University of Kosovo Natal. So we do have a, a better understanding of each other. I respect him a lot. He's a bright young person, and I think he's going to make a good politician into the future. But you know, maybe maybe the the situation in that meeting was such that I think just something went wrong and I, I don't think uh, you know, I should say anything more than that. But I'm glad he has apologized. Is there political interference at ESCO? I haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it. But ESCOM operates within a political environment that you know how it is in South Africa. What does that mean? What it means is that uh, we operate in a volatile political environment. That's all I can say. That's the best description I can. The, the politics of South Africa is volatile. But how does that affect you, your ability to do what you have been brought on this board to do? Well, I indicated that the difference between ideas and implementation is very the gap is too big and we must try as a board and as the policy makers to close that together you know there is no shortage of ideas or good and excellent ideas that are doable in south africa there's not there's no shortage of that we have got very many bright people around but it is taking these ideas and actually implementing them within the policy framework that we, ha we have and within the developing democracy that we're trying to encourage that really takes time mm -hmm. and requires patience. Sometimes it requires unbearable, inordinate patience. But you know, as I say, when you are a solution seeker, you must never lose patience. You must have the focus and the determination that what you are doing is the correct path and you must get everybody to buy in. They may buy in at the beginning and say we want to do this, but they may not actually buy in into the action. Mm. So you have many steps to follow in order for an action to be implemented. And as I say, as the board, all we can do is to persist with that which we think will provide the solution for the load shedding and for the corruptions that we have found and for the poor governance and the performance that we have found in ESCOM that I have to say over the last two and a half years ESCOM has stabilized in terms of as an organization the performance is improving here at ESCOM in terms of its staff the culture of excellence is getting back so all of these are elements that often people don't hear about, mm. but that's as a result of this board that we are talking about and the executive that we have at the moment. Prof, thank you so much for uh, having this conversation with us and at least giving us a bit of insight into your own thinking around the issues that ESCOM is facing currently. I think in spite of, of all that you have said, I, I also walk away from this conversation realizing that indeed, um, load shedding is not going to go anywhere anytime soon and I don't think that ESCOM necessarily is able to be able to provide answers or at least very clear answers about when that situation will change. Is that fair? Yeah, it's fair. I mean the, the, the problem of load shedding and ESCOM is not going to be solved by ESCOM alone. I think that much we are very clear. It's going to be a collective of many stakeholders that have the interest of the country to solve that. It's not, it's not an ESCOM problem alone. All right. Yeah. I think on that note, that's where we'll leave it with this uh, conversation. This is the ESCOM board chair, Professor Malekha Buru Mahoba.